this is a livestock response to disaster, disease, and high path avian influenza outbreaks. The applications are endless. We have roadkill, fish and seafood residuals, recalled meats, source reduction for prion diseases, mass casualty, butcher waste, beach marine animals, farm mortality. We had mink, COVID in mink in 2021. And we have LPAI, low path avian influenza, and highly pathogenic avian influenza right now. We had it in 2015 and 2022, 23 at this point. High path avian influenza is an airborne disease that can spread. So we have to deal with it in a um, succinct manner. In this presentation, I'm gonna talk about, primarily talk about high path avian influenza, but I also want us to know that there are other diseases that we have responded to and do respond to with um, airborne diseases and other diseases. Um, brucellosis suai is an airborne disease that is zoonotic, uh, which means we can catch it from the pigs. Foul cholera is also another disease that can be passed from fowl to fowl, but not fowl to people at this point. There are floods, blizzards, fires, barn collapses, where we have to deal with and dispose of, pro properly dispose of livestock. Virulent Newcastle has been in the Northwest, Northern California. Either way, we need to manage all of these disasters and diseases in a proper manner and dispose of these animals properly. We can't do things like put them, put putting carcasses in low areas, ponds, other places, uh, out back, um, because we can spread disease and or we will attract wild animals and the wild animals can spread disease. So just a, a quick sheet, cheat sheet on high path avian influenza. So how do we get it? We had it in 2015 in the United States. We have it in other countries, but 2015 was the first time that the United States had it. And we lost 40 to 50 million birds, turkeys and chickens in that outbreak. What happens is in the springtime, the wild birds start migrating and migrate north. And if they have avian influenza, if they're carrying avian influenza, all they need to do is get into a grain bin, get onto a rooftop of a building where the air intake may pull the disease in and affect the birds that are in those houses. Um, all they have to do is just, just visit. We do a really great job, I think, of keeping wild birds out of our houses, but in fact, it does happen. And we need to, you know, make sure that we're taking precautions to stop that. So with disease, we need to think about how we're gonna dispose of these animals. Um, but with disease, we need to move the animals as little as possible. 
keep animals in a structure if we are able to. If they can be in a barn or in a warehouse, that will keep the disease a little bit more controlled. Um, keep animals off the ground. Once the animals hit the ground and if the ground is cool in the springtime, uh, the puddles are cool, that disease can spread from the puddles and affect more wild birds and can also bring it closer to our domestic stock. Consider your air handling systems. We need to make sure that workers in these barns have proper aeration and that the birds that are still alive have proper aeration. But in doing that, we also can be potentially spewing some of the disease out of the barn and to other places. So we have to think about that. Um, employees, labor, farm crews can also affect, effectively spread the disease. Uh, if, a if a farm crew and farm crews tend to pull birds out of houses when we're changing, cha changing flocks, they may be working on lots of different farms during that time period. We have to make sure that they aren't bringing the disease from farm to farm to farm. Um, and there are ways to do that. Sometimes we're showering in, showering out. When we're doing these disease, working with some of these diseases, and there may need to be some downtime for a crew if they need to go to another farm, so that they're not not spreading that disease. Um, We have to think about what methodology we're going to use. Um, we're doing a lot of composting of these animals at this point. Um, some do get buried, but water tables are high in the spring and it is hard to bury millions of birds in on any farm. Um, it will affect water supply, it will affect uh, air, it will affect soil. So we really don't want to be burying as much as possible. Composting is very effective and we started employing that in the 90s, 1990s. And when avian influenza broke, we started in 2015, USDA APHIS said, we really need to compost as much as possible. So we need to find feedstock. We need to find um, the equipment. And we need to actually figure out whether we're going to compost, whether we're going to bury, whether we're going to um, dispose of them in another way. Um, for the most part, burning has been ruled out because it's really hard to burn birds. There are large percentage of water and it's hard for us to be able to do that. So composting methods. Most of the birds are composted in static, passive, static or passively aerated compost piles. We may add some turns into that later in the process, but if we turned the compost too early in the process, we would have problems with spreading that disease. So we don't wanna turn too early, but we're going to talk about that as we go. In vessels, vessels can work. They don't generally are not used that much um, because of their throughput. We need to get, we need to be processing these animals as fast as we possibly can. So we do use a lot of bucket loaders, a lot of buckets to move animals around in these situations, some very large buckets, some smaller buckets, but a lot of this equipment is available on farms. Some folks, and this 
particular site is, I think, DOT, a DOT site in Montana, where they decided to use um, cement barriers to designate the different piles of, of livestock in those. In that situation, they are composting roadkill and domestic stock at this point. We need to select a site. We're gonna compost at this point. So we need to select a site. We need to look at where all of our water is, whether it's the human drinking water, animals, livestock drinking water, ponds, surface water, groundwater, and, and streams that might be running by. So we have to look for all of these things and be a safe distance away. 200 feet is not a magic number, um, but we do wanna make sure that we're in a good location. Carbon, and I'll mention carbon a lot in this talk. Carbon is really important. We need a coarse carbon. We're using a static pile method so we expect that the microbes in those piles will do the work all by themselves. And in order for them to do the work by themselves, they have to have air. So we use a coarse wood chip, that chunky wood chip. We don't really wanna use a lot of sawdust. Sawdust is just too fine and doesn't allow air to circulate through those piles. We can use the coarse carbon, which is just a municipal wood chip most of the time. Um, if there's a lot of wood, you know, standing wood around that we would call junk trees or, you know, sumac or something like that, those can be chipped and used if there isn't standing wood in a lot of places. We also can use standing wood from forest fires if that can be, that can be chipped and used. Municipalities, our, our public municipalities know where a lot of this coarse carbon is. So if you have a disaster, you need to be working with these folks to find good carbon. Um, shavings, mixed carbon works well, and uh, tub grindings are working, work pretty well. When we're composting dead animals, our goal is to kill the disease, not to make a good compost product. We will ultimately make a good compost product, but it will take longer because we use chunky wood chips and there are gonna be bones in those piles. So they also act as part of the carbon in the process. We have to use correct PPE in personal protective equipment in disease outbreaks. And really, we don't know if animals have diseases, if they've died, we don't always know that. So sometimes we need to take those precautions, even in mass, even in, in routine mortality. We have full Tyvek suits, there's Tycam, there's Tyvek, we have hoods and hats, um, hard hats, masks, boots, and usually triple boots. And sometimes we need respirators in these situations, but that's determined on the sites. Our boots, our ankles, and our wrists are taped into our, our, our suits so that nothing leaks in to the suits to affect us. So carbon again, what we do, so this is a uh, 60,000 turkeys needed to be composted. They were all different sizes, all different age groups. We, in the top, top um, right corner, we have sunflower hull. The farm happened to be bedding with sunflower hulls. And 
we could use those as a carbon source. I wasn't sure if they would be an ideal carbon source, but they worked very well. The air spaces, it, they, the shell provided airspace, and that air was able to circulate through the piles. After we pushed the birds back to the sides, then we added some more wood shavings and mixed carbon on top of that, and then started moving the birds back onto the bed. So we always will have a bed of carbon. We'll always wanna put the carbon on those beds. These animals were already in the barn, uh, floor raised, and we needed to push them back and then pull them back into the center. They also had a pile of hot manure. And I would encourage every farm that we, that exists to compost their manure, to compost their um, mortality, their routine mortality. And then they have practice to be able to execute this when a disaster breaks. I think it's really important for us to, to push that as much as possible. This happened to be a, a manure pile. I am standing on top of it and it was 150 degrees. So we can jumpstart, this is March, it was March, and we can jumpstart the whole process and use some of that manure as the cover for these birds and mix it in with the birds because that's gonna give us nitrogen and it's gonna give us good coverage over the birds. We have to compost everything. And really we need to mix everything together to be able to compost it. We have to compost all the feed, the eggs, the manure, and the carcasses. The waters needed to be emptied and pulled up. They will be disinfected before they go back down and we get back into production. Um, so the water also may need to go into those compost piles. So in this situation, uh, these pictures were, we see a forklift dumping pallets of eggs down into a big mixing building. This is a huge mixing building, a couple hundred yards um, long. And the eggs, the manure, the feed, the carcasses were all mixed in there as houses were being emptied. So it's important for us to and those are being lifted up that high because we really need to throw the eggs off of that forklift so that they break as much as possible. If we put in, we can put whole eggs into a pile, but we're gonna end up with hard boiled pucks. And when they, when the temperature, the ambient temperature goes up and those are spread on a field, we're gonna have little stink bombs everywhere because they will start to rot eventually. So it's really important as much as possible when we have to compost eggs and liquid egg and all that, that it all gets mixed in well in the process. We prepare a base. These are two bases and your bases are gonna be as long as you have space. They need to be about 18 feet wide for large outbreaks. So 18, eight, 18, 18 feet wide. And that can be a little bit shorter depending on the equipment that you're using. So it could be anywhere from, from 16 to 18 feet. And as long as we can make those beds, that's that chunky carbon that we're putting down. If we have particularly liquid waste, liquid birds from flooding, um, blood, uh, butcher waste, some of those, we may need to make a, 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 a divot or a, a bowl so that the animals, the liquid waste has time to soak in. Then we mix the whole thing together once it's soaked in and it never hits the, it should never hit the ground. Birds never should be on the ground. This was a bird that was smushed um, that's a good way to, to spread disease. This is a huge, another huge mixing barn, um, and all those ingredients are mixed together in there. 
Loaders are used to move, or loaders, buckets, barrels are used to move all of the material to the, the compost, to the carbon. And just another situation with butcher waste where they're moving it out and they have a sort of that bowl and that will all get covered over and compost. This particular operation was using more manure than was appropriate, um, but I'm not gonna tell people what to do. I can't, I can't demand that people do certain things. So um, they actually evolved to using wood chips all by themselves because the manure, the liquid manure and the dense manure was just a little bit too dense to allow the air to flow through. And it's easy to learn, this is gonna work better. So we have the bed down, we put a layer of chickens. What's a layer of chickens? So 24 inches of carbon, and then about 12 inches of chickens. If we're doing it in layers, you saw where we were mixing all the materials together because we had lots of different materials that had to be composted. Those are centers. So those would be moved to that, that layer or to that windrow um, in a center. We need to keep that 24 inches from the edge. So that whole center is like a Twinkie middle. And then we put the carbon over top of that and make sure everything is covered by 24 inches of material. So a second layer of birds is going on here and then we're gonna cover it. With large animals, with small, with, with large animals, we can have one in a pile. So if we have a 1200 pound cow, we can put that in the middle of a pile, put an envelope of carbon around it, and it will compost by itself. With smaller animals, we have to have a carbon to nitrogen balance in there. So we need layers or mixed centers so that the, the process can even work. We have to keep that, even though it's all wrong to start with, we have to keep that carbon and nitrogen balance correct so that once the microbes start mixing all the material together, it works. My adage is if we can lay, lift it, we can layer it. So I can't lift a cow or a horse or you know large animals. I can lift and I can, you know, even though we're using buckets to move a lot of these, I can put the smaller animals in layers. We do that with roadkill as well as um, pigs, chickens, goats, sheep. Um, so we have, we had a whole lot of roadkill that was ended up being collected and froze. Uh, we putting on a second layer of, of deer here and you know, sometimes you are physically handling a lot of the animals. Make sure you have protective equipment when you're doing that. Second layer. Um, so we put down a 24 inch bed. We put two deer. If we're doing deer, we need that carbon to nitrogen ratio or goats. We need that carbon to nitrogen ratio to be correct. So two deer on the bottom back to back. And then we put another layer of 12 inches of chips down. We put another couple of deer in that pile and we put 24 inches of chips on top of that. Everything has to be covered. The snout, the uh, feet, the legs, everything has to be covered by carbon. I use this wood chip analysis. This was some the some work that we had, were doing for Department of Transportation in New York State. Um, we sampled all of the wood chips that we were going to envelop the deer in. And we came up with all of these different organisms. Fecal coliform, E. coli, salmonella was very low, but fecal strep, fecal enterococci, were all pretty high for a regular municipal wood chip. Uh, we had to deduce that this was that this was because the 
animals live in the trees, they poop in the trees, they pee in the trees, they everything. So um, we end up with bacteria in the trees and when they get chipped, it's all mixed together and we have it. So we don't put this up here to scare people. We just tell people to wear gloves and to wash your hands after you're managing, after you're playing in ships. We need to make sure that we've covered everything well. This is a winter composting. It will occur in the winter. It, composting will occur in the winter and it'll work pretty well. And we can tell that because the peak of that pile doesn't have any snow on it. So that pile is cooking and it's composting the roadkill that are in that windrow. Within 12 to 24 hours, we should have temperatures if we've built have good temperatures if we've built the piles correctly. This pile went up to 70 C very quickly. These piles, it's three different piles, um, went up to 70 C very quickly. So that's, um, that's what we wanna see. As long as the air is circulating around and the animals are not frozen in that pile, the temperature should be able to get up there if we've built the process right and if we have good aeration. So that's the importance of having those chunky wood chips is to make sure that we have our temperatures. If we do use material that's too dense, do we rebuild? There are other things that we would tend to do, um, but I don't tend to wanna take apart tremendous windrows. I just want to do better when I build the next one over. So make sure that we have that chunky carbon, use it. Um, sorry, this is just a pig being put into a pile. And this is a brucellosis suai situation. They're just taking samples to confirm if all the pigs had brucellosis suai. And then we're covering everything. So whether it's a cow or a horse or a pig or, or whatever, we want to make sure it's well covered and that nothing is sticking out. But more often than not, house pets, dogs, cats will get into these piles, dig into these piles. Um, then the vultures and the coyotes will get into those piles and will take them apart if they have anything that's sticking out. So the pile temperature increases to 131 or so. We'd like it to be aiming for 131 to 150. So that temperature heats up, the pile heats up, the heat rises, and this is why we have the wood chips or the air plenum on the bottom. We want air to come in from the bottom to aerate those microbes so that they can get most of the work done before we have to do anything. This was a situation where we had lost a hundred cows plus cows to a, a barn explosion and fire. And I was so excited with this one. Um, I got a call from Soil and Water Conservation District. They said this, this had occurred. Can we compost there? And they had wood chips out to that farm before the farmers could even ask for them. Um, they, and they were ready to put them in. They, the chips were there when the farmers were ready to, to clean up all of this, um, destruction. So it worked really well. We had a hundred yard long windrow, um, but it worked very well. This is a facility that composts horses. Um, and our big, the big thing that we use, the tool that we use in these processes is a thermometer. So temperature probes are about the only thing that we need to use. And that tells us what's happening in the pile, that the pile is working and that we've killed the viruses and pathogens. So the time it takes, and this is for a full size cow, um, the first month we're going to have like cooked meat. Second month, 
we're going to have digested meat. Those microbes are, are digesting everything. And the third month, we can have clean bones if we have that good aeration. Um, mature, we won't have mature compost until about six to nine months. And we really looked at this in terms of pathogens. It, we can have pathogen regrowth in piles. And if we wait that long, that draws down all the pathogens and we don't have regrowth issues. Um, smaller animals, poultry, takes like 14 days. Now the work that we're doing with a high path avian influenza is Sorry, the work that we're doing, the high path avian influenza, I am a subject matter expert in, in high path avian influenza and in disease in general. So I can go out, I'm asked to go out by the USDA APHIS to go out and work with farmers to get materials into pile. There are a few dozen, dozens of us that do this at this point. In 2015, I think we had about 10 people that were working throughout the country um, and Canada. Don't, I, we have avian influenza in Canada. They are still responding to disease outbreaks, as are we in Virginia um, right now. So it takes about 14 days before we wanna do anything. So we want temperature to be in those piles before they get moved so that we're not spreading disease. In 14 days, if we are composting indoors, we can move those birds. If we've gotten our temperatures, we can take those birds, those windrows and move them outside of the barn so that they, the farmers can start cleaning the barns and get everything, um, get everything cleaned up and sanitized. Butcher residual with no bones pretty quickly. Fisheries, 16 to 24 days with a 40, for, with 40 pound salmon from the fisheries. Roadkill about nine months. We still will have bones, teeth, hair, wool, possibly in some of our piles when the process is finished. We encourage people to use, to reuse, like for, for livestock composting, we encourage people to reuse the bones, reuse that compost, and the bones will add more carbon to the next round, if there is a next round, if you're using it for your routine mortality. Um, we have resources that are available on all of the, for all different animals from horses to cows and butcher waste to avian influenza and poultry composting uh, to roadkill. We also have USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service has standard operating procedures for both high path avian influenza and for livestock mortality composting protocols. These can be accessed and need to be accessed by anybody who needs to respond to disease outbreaks in, in uh, animal agriculture. When we have a, a team out on the farms for avian influenza, we have team members from USDA APHIS, from the state's natural resources, uh, natural resources entity, whether it's DEC, DEP, or whatever they're called <laughs> in each state. Um, we might have somebody from ag and markets in each state. We, would we definitely would have the state vet involved in all of these situations. Um, and some other people as well. We'll have our 
somebody that knows how to incorporate the animals into compost piles and monitor them and get everything taken care of. And that is the subject matter expert. There'll be one or two of those on a farm. Um, and they're stretched because there have been a lot of outbreaks. So we can compost just about anything. We composted a northern right whale um, many years ago. So it was a 40,000 pound animal that was caught and killed in fishing equipment and needed to be managed. And they asked, this skeleton was actually re-articulated. It was composted and then re-articulated and a museum was built because there, are only, there aren't that many Northern right whales left in the environment. So they preserved this one and we try to do better all the time, so. Thank you.